Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the meeting of the Sixth Law Working Group. Please make sure that you are in the right room. My name is Carlos Gomez. The other chair is Shweta Bandari. She is remote today. Our responsible AD is Eric Klein. Um, at the moment, he's not yet here, but he will arrive a bit later because of a conflict with another meeting. And uh, I think we need minute takers. So is there anyone who would like to volunteer for taking minutes? Uh, I, I will I will uh, I will help as well uh, Carlos Georgios from the Atlantic. Okay, hello Georgios, that's uh, very helpful. Thanks a lot. And also Lohan has expressed that he will also be helping. So thank you very much. This is really useful. And recall that uh, as usual we will be using Hedgedoc to take minutes. You can find the link at the end of the slide and everyone feel free to join and contribute also to the process of taking minutes. Then, as in the last few ITF meetings, there are also a few tips for this one. For in-person participants, please make sure that you sign into the session by using Miteco. Uh, for example, you may use the on-site tool, which is available from the data tracker agenda. Remember that you need to use Miteco to join the queue because there's a single unified queue which is managed from Miteco. And then uh, also blue sheets are automatically generated from Miteco. So if you haven't done so yet, please do join the Miteco session. Also for remote participants, just keep your audio and video off unless you are presenting. Well, this is the note well. Perhaps you have already seen it several times uh, already at this point of the week. Anyway, recall that this is a reminder of ITF policies which are in effect on a number of important topics like patents or code of conduct. So please uh, make sure that you have read it. And this is the agenda proposed for today. The first slot corresponds to the usual uh, chair's introduction, which is currently in progress. This will be followed by a presentation by Pascal on IPv6 and the prefix registration. Then the next presentation will be given by myself on the topic of transmission of sheet compressed packets over 15.4 networks. Then there will be a set of two presentations given by Luigi. The first one is the base a document for path aware semantic addressing for LLNs. And the second one is a related draft entitled generic address assignment option for Sixlopan ND. Then the last presentation will be given by uh, Young Wan on the transmission of IPv6 packets over short range optical wireless communication. So this leads to a total of 75 minutes of allocated time. Uh, perhaps you may recall that we requested a 90 minute session, but instead we got 120 minutes. So we have ample time. Uh, so perhaps it won't be necessary to rush as much as in other previous meetings. And uh, let's hope that we can use the time available for discussions. Other than that, is there any comment on the agenda? Okay, so next is the report of the status of working group documents. Since the last ITF, we have one new RFC, that's RFC 9453, on six law applicability and use cases. Congratulations to the authors and many thanks to everyone who has contributed in the process uh, with comments, reviews, and so on. This has been quite a long journey. Uh, so again, thanks to everyone involved. Then uh, the next document is the multicast address listener uh, subscription document, which uh, is currently in AD evaluation. However, recently uh, Eric, just a few hours ago, submitted a review. So uh, yeah, Pascal is mentioning something uh, in the chat. Uh, Pascal, do you want to 
to say something? Well, I just saw the message by Eric um, on the chat, but I did not see his email. <clears throat> so, so that's why I was uh, surprised that there was a need for a revised ID. But if there is an email in the six remaining list, I will find it and uh, I will work on it. Yeah, so the, the message was sent just a few hours ago, uh, not one day ago. So yeah, it's actually quite recent. Yeah, so now the, the document is in revised ID needed after the comments by Eric. OK, so then there are three other working group documents which are at earlier stages. Uh, first, we have the Path Aware Semantic Addressing for LLNs. It has been updated since the last ITF. It's now at version 03. Then also the transmission of chic compress package over 15.4 networks has been updated, currently at version 04. And the last one is IPv6 ND prefix registration, uh, which also has been updated since the last ITF and it's currently at version 01. Uh, by the way, there will be a presentation for each one of these last three working group documents later today. So uh, is there any comment, any question? Okay, so if there is no comments or questions, then uh, we can proceed to the next presentation, which will be given by Pascal precisely on the IPv6 and the prefix registration. Um, can you please pull up the slides? Or do you want me to do it? Yeah, so... Um, Yeah. Thank do you, you want, thank you. If you want, yes, I can navigate you, the slides. Oh, uh, if you give me the the rights to do them, then I will do it. Okay, so I pass the control to you. Okay, I get it. Thank you, Carlos. Okay, so um, this is a refresher on the uh, six low prefix registration. So, uh, as you all know, this is a, um, a family of RFCs which deal with uh, how the host can signal to the router that it owns uh, or it, wish, it wishes to own an address. And uh, we have extended that to the capability to expose that you want to receive traffic for uh, an anycast or a multicast address. And with this draft, which, is, which was uh, adopted before the last IATF, um, we are now allowing the host to, to claim to the router that it wishes to receive all traffic for a particular prefix. And this is kind of timely, as I will show in the next, last slide, because there's a lot of work now on how to, to delegate prefixes to the hosts. Okay, so the whole idea is, yes, the host may uh, wish to have uh, not only addresses, but a full prefix. And there is a need for the routers to know which prefix the host has in order to possibly inject those prefixes in the local routing. And that, there are a number of use cases for that. There is the old networking node uh, option, which, which is like 20 years old and, and explained that uh, a host can, can have a network inside and some recursive model of a host inside an, uh, a network inside a host and a host inside that network, etc. Then there is um, the use case of Kubernetes, where today mostly you know Kubernetes supports v6, um, but but it's mostly used in in the case of v4. And what you want to do is uh, pretty much delegate a, a slash 96 for each private IPv4 realm and keep them isolated using IPv6, but uh, maintain a flat IPv6 routing as opposed to using all those encapsulation and overlays that you find today. And then um, you, you, you could effectively have the case, which is more like uh, the, the home network type, where uh, you have a gateway inside a home network, which has its own prefix, but would like the devices in, um, in the home network to be able to reach that prefix. And the, one way to do that is to effectively tell the, the real home gateway, the main home gateway, that this additional gateway has this prefix. And then again, what's needed is an, an abstract technique uh, 
um, which would not depend on which type of routing protocol runs in the network for this host or, or this gateway to be able to advertise to, to the main router, hey, I have this prefix. If there is any traffic for that prefix, please uh, give it to me. Uh, last but not least, we, we found something which I, I consider a bug um, in, in some APs where if you delegate a, a, a prefix to the host and then the, um, the AP is supposed to send the packets to the MAC address of, of that host, uh, because it has not seen any of the operation on, on the address effectively, because it's the whole prefix that, that belongs to the host, the, the AP decides to, to drop the packet, which is a very, very, very sad and bad idea. But um, basically, if the, the AP knows what is there by snooping in D, and if, if there was a method like this, that the AP could snoop, then it could effectively figure that truly the, this route should go via this host, and then it would not drop the packet. Well, I mean, it should never do that anyway, but since it's there and people find it interesting to do it, don't ask me why, at least we would have a way to signal them, hey, this prefix is okay for this host. <clears throat> now, once um, the host registers the prefix to, to the routing, what the routing does with it is up to the routing. I mean, it could be just proxy ND, or, or there could be uh, a slash 48 um, that encompasses this slash 64. And as, as long as the, the host stays within the domain where this uh, slash 48 is aggregated, then it's perfectly OK for this host to retain this prefix. So uh, mobility is, is uh, an important game here. If you obtain a prefix somewhere and you want to move to a different link, arguably you have to obtain a new prefix, meaning that you have to remember all, all the addresses that were derived from that prefix. And, and that's a sad idea because we know we are not too good at remembering in general. So it would be a lot better if the host could just move to this different link within the same domain, be aware that it is the same domain and tell the routers, hey, please now advertise this slash 64 that I was ended into the domain, um, but fr from my place. So with my new link local that I just formed in this new link. And now th 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 there, was, there was a point on the uh, physics of mailing list saying, hey, it would be nice to have this. And guess what? We, we almost have it. And the, the key effectively is to be able to prove that the, uh, the host effectively owns the address, meaning it is the host to which the HCP has handed the prefix if it's the HCP. So bottom line to, to where we are, with this draft, we have a way for a host or a node to advertise to the local router, I, I have this prefix, please, if I set the orbit on, advertise it in whatever routing you're doing, meaning the host doesn't need to know what routing protocol is happening in the domain. And uh, conversely, the router doesn't need to know how the host obtained the prefix. Now, there could be policies in, in a network where uh, effectively the host can only get delegated prefixes, in which case it's possible to, to go to the DHCP server and validate that the delegation has happened. But then there is a need to prove that it is effectively this host. And, and we'll see in the next slide that, that, that it's effectively possible. Now, one key element here is that the host or, or, or the server in, this, in the case that I've drawn here has the capability to decide whether to inject the route itself. For instance, if it's a ripple aware node, it may decide to inject the route in Ripple by itself. On the other hand, if it's like uh, this, this server in, in a, a cloud network that I've represented here, it might decide, hey, I don't know how the, the, the routing happens in this cloud I'm connected to, so I will just set the orbit in the arrow to say, please route all the traffic for that prefix back to me. And so, so that's the, the, that's the goal of the orbit. The orbit was already there for host. It's just the same that we use for prefixes. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure many of you have, have heard about it, but there is a lot of traction, a lot of attention at the six ups and, and, and at six men as well, because there is a related draft about uh, the HTTP PD per device. The whole idea being, hey, if this device needs a lot of addresses or if there are uh, 
other devices that are tethered to this first device or there are virtual machines in the device, etc., which is more like the case I just represented before. It would be very, very cool for, for the host to get uh, the prefix. And so this is what this V6 ops uh, draft uh, discusses and presents. And like I said, I, I believe there is a lot of traction and a lot of desire for this to happen. And personally, I do desire, I believe that this happens. Um, we, my point here is that this draft is a perfect companion to, to the work on, on the HCPP per device. Because the whole idea is today there is this, this kind of missing link between a hey, DHCP has handed the prefix and the routing protocols that operate in that domain on the aggregation where the 64 is are aware and there is the right route that is injected and moved as the node moves. And if you remember the, the six-man uh, architecture document that we have started, there is this desire to, um, to be able to move an address within the domain and having a routing protocol with uh, particular capabilities more on the money side to be able to follow the address. Well, the same concept happens exactly here with a prefix. If you're able, if a host is able to inject the prefix to the first router, then the SGP, the, the subnet gateway protocol that runs within the subnet would also be able to track the prefix as the device moves. So having this capability to, to expose the prefix where the host is, to move the prefix as the host moves, that is a, a, a very good companion to, to the capability to delegate the prefix in the first place. And so here's an example of flow of uh, how this would, this would happen. So <clears throat> what, what typically happens when the, the, the host, so, so in our case, it's a 6LN, but figure that it could be a, a server in a cloud network as I represented earlier, or it could be a phone or anything. So what it does is after it has found the DHCP server or through the relay, uh, it will make a request for uh, uh, IAPD, basically get, getting a prefix delegated. And if there is a relay, the relay will uh, forward that to the DHCP server. And the idea right now with the V6 ops draft is, is the, the, the relay snoops um, the reply. And if there are more than one, six LR, remember in our case, I can be many of them, they all have to snoop the reply, meaning there needs to be as many relay forward and they relay replies as there are routers, which is kind of inconvenient. Um, and then the, the, the reply, which I wrote replay, don't ask me why, uh, which is the, the, uh, the host. And now the host knows that uh, it can use this prefix. But note what we've done here. What we've done is we, we have used the, the rover, the, the route, uh, the, the uh, ownership very, verifier, basically. The, the, the thing, the, the token that we built for FC 8928, which is formed out of uh, a key pair that the, the 6LN has formed, meaning that the rover is something that the 6LN can prove it owns. We already use it with RSC 8928 for hosts. What we are doing here is we are extending this concept to prefixes, meaning when you do an IAPD, uh, the device unique ID, so device ID, will be set to the row. And so the DHCP server will remember the, the device ID for which it gave this prefix. So now it stores the row. What that means is when the 6LN registers the address or moves and re-registers the gear, as part of the ERO, it will expose the rover. And what the 6LR can do is to to use a, a list query to the DHCP server. And the, the, the list query reply contains the, the, the device ID, so the, the device unique ID. So with this, the 6LR can check with the DHCP server that this prefix was effectively associated with this uh, DUID. And that kind of serves as an equivalent to the um, um, the, the request that we normally do um, with, with this central registrar that we have in 6 open ND. So this, this basically validates that, yes, this prefix has been uh, allocated, and guess what? The unique ID to which it was allocated is this. 
So what's left for the 6LR is to validate that effectively the 6LN owns that rover. And for this, we can use the, the round trip exactly like it is defined in 8928. So, so the, the DNA uh, has a status validation requested with an ounce, and the, uh, the, the host, the 6LN, does an, a second registration, but this time it contains um, the, the nouns from the 6LR, its own nouns, plus additional information that is uh, signed with the private address from which the rover was derived. So now we have, we have this host, which is effectively and uh, probably the host that has obtained this um, prefix from the DHCP server. And it does not depend anymore on the link local address. It's the DOAD that serves as proof. Meaning that if this host now moves to a different place, it will retain its private key, it will retain the DOAD, so it's, it's able to prove that it owns the prefix throughout its mobility inside the domain. So basically, all this discussion does not really depend on whether it's a 64, longer than 64, shorter than 64, whatever. It's, it's, it's not dependent on prefix size and slash 128 is just, it's just a specific case of this. But basically whatever we've been doing for hosts is effectively exactly the same for prefixes, meaning that we can prove the ownership and we can move. So what we really miss to have this flow happening exactly like this is maybe something in DNS to signal that the prefix was obtained through the HCP, so the the uh, the six LR can effectively know it needs to do a least query. But maybe there is already a policy which says, hey, if a host claims a prefix, the new I'm doing it is is the HCP PD, so go and and check the server. So it's not really needed. But if we wanted to, yes, we could have this flag in DNS to say, hey. This is a DHCP address, or, or this is formed through another, whatever other way. At the moment, we really want to keep that agnostic. The 6LR doesn't know where the prefix comes from, and, and the 6LN doesn't know what kind of routing takes place. But if we want to, to expose that detail, we could. And that's pretty much it, Carlos. So uh, I'll be happy to take any question. Okay, any, <clears throat> any questions or comments? So perhaps it would be good um, if we can have some review at some point uh, to have feedback on the mailing list on the draft. So- As I, uh, I will probably republish uh, because this flow is not in the draft yet, but I yeah, think yeah. it should be. And considering the, the raising interest in, in uh, the HCP PD, um, really that, that creates a very good use case uh, for, this, for the draft. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd be very happy that you call for review, but please let me, let me publish uh, the, the, the new version with this flow in it. Okay, sounds, sounds very good. So there will be a version 02, including the updates, and then it will be great if, uh, the working group can provide feedback. Any question? Okay, so if there is no other questions, then we can proceed to the next presentation. So, Shweta, do you think you can navigate the slides? I think I need to control presenting it as well. So do you want to shop, stop sharing? I'll load it and navigate. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this presentation is 
about uh, the last updates of the draft and title transmission of she compressed packets over IEEE 802.15.4 networks. My co-author is Anna Minaburo. Next, please. So first of all, a quick reminder on uh, what we are trying to do in this document. On the slide, you can see two protocol stacks. The one on the left corresponds to the traditional six lupin based protocol stack for devices running on top of 15.4. So in that case, you can see that uh, below IPv6, there is six lupin which performs, among other functions, header compression and also fragmentation. So what we're trying to do in the document is to enable the protocol stack on the right, which, uh, as you can see, for header compression would uh, enable the use of chic as the mechanism for, for that, to compress the headers of IPv6 and perhaps also UDP and co-op, while still keeping Sitlupan fragmentation. So here, uh, chic is the main product of the LP1 working group. It's specified in RFC 8724. And the expectation is that it can provide a greater compression degree, so better performance uh, from that point of view. And the trick is that it is based on exploiting a priori knowledge of the header field values of the packets that will be transmitted. And that would be stored in some context at the compressor and decompressor sites. Next, please. So on the status of the draft, um, it was adopted in January. And today I'm presenting uh, two updates since the last ITF. The first, actually the, the main one is version 03 which contains several additions and updates, mostly intended to address the comments from both Kiran and Georgios. By the way, thanks a lot to both for the comprehensive reviews and many uh, useful comments. And also a minor update, which is 04, which incorporates some of the feedback that was received uh, from the Chic Working Group Interim that was held in October 17, where this draft was also presented. Next, please. So first of all, uh, regarding the table of contents on the organization of the document, there are a few updates. In section three, uh, there was 3.1 entitled protocol stack until the previous versions up to 0.2. However, now it's plural, it's protocol stacks, because now it includes two subsections, 3.1.1, focuses on the main protocol stack that I was uh, showing a couple of slides ago. And the second one, 312, illustrates what we call transition protocol stacks, which would be those where 6 lopan header compression is still used to compress IPv6 headers, but then chic is used or can be used to compress upper layer protocol headers, as you will see later. Then we've also added section 3.3 on single hop communication. This one is actually quite short. However, it was missing. And the last update uh, in terms of table of contents is that the summary table, which was previously at the end of section three, has now been updated and also relocated. Now it's at the end of section four. Um, as you will see later, it includes a summary of which are the artifacts that are used in the data plane to support the different communication modes that are enabled in this document. So it's better to do that probably once the different frame formats have been presented before in section four. Next, please. So now let's go through the updates in uh, the actual content of the draft. So first we have one update in the introduction. This is after a comment by Georgios and it is about the what is the typical size of the UDP compressed header by using RFC 6282. So uh, previously we mentioned that that size is four bytes. However, it's true that uh, the UDP checksum can be compressed in some cases. So now to be on the safe side, what we indicate in the text is that uh, the typical UDP compressed compress header size would be from two to four bytes. Perhaps the, the question is what is actually more typical, maybe two or maybe four bytes. Uh, actually, feedback on that would be really useful. But yeah, perhaps the text as it is, is at least aiming to be safe. And in consequence, we also mention 
that the typical IPv6 UDP compressed header size with RFC 6282 uh, can be down to six bytes with link local addresses. Uh, this was in the previous version. Now we say from four to six bytes and for global addresses, it could be down to seven bytes. Although now we have updated that to say five to seven bytes. Any comments? Okay, uh, next please. So in section 312, as introduced before, uh, we illustrate which are the so-called transition protocol stacks, where again, the idea is that here, six low pan is used to compress IPv6 headers. However, chic is used to compress upper layer headers. So um, first of all, it is possible to compress co-op headers by means of chic. Uh, we have RFC 8824, which enables that. And actually there are the two options uh, that are shown on the slide. On the right, what we have is that chic compressed co-op messages can be carried on top of DTLS. And also it is possible to have uh, the option on the left, which is not using DTLS. However, recall that RFC 8824 also allows to compress um, also OSCOR if that is used uh, for protection of end-to-end uh, -end payloads in co -op. Next, please. Yeah, now, yeah, thank you. So uh, the other transition protocol stack that is still included here is uh, the one where 6LOPAN is used to compress uh, the IPv6 headers, but then chic is used to compress UDP and co-op headers. Well, so far in previous versions of this draft, uh, this document itself was defining, was enabling this. But now, uh, recently, the Chic Working Group archi Architecture Draft has been defining functionality which actually covers what is shown here. So it's likely that in the future, uh, it's in the Chic Architecture Draft that any functionality uh, needed will be defined. So probably in this document that I'm presenting today, we will mostly need to refer to the Chic Architecture document. Next, please. Yeah, there's a comment by Laurent. Hi, Laurent Toutain. So two comments. First, the architecture is still at the beginning, so your input will be welcome to, to make it converge with the, the chic architecture. And I didn't understand in the previous slide where, you, where the architecture was involved. In the previous one. In the previous slide, you with the stack where you have a yeah, you mean uh, two, two slides ago or in the... Uh, no, this is before, the one before, I think. So slide number seven, can we maybe switch to that? Yes, on this one. So it's because you want to recognize the IP address for defining which is uh, which chic header will be involved. That's what you said. No, well, uh, the point is that... Uh, in, in this document, we were defining like everything needed to try to enable doing what the protocol stack shows. But now it seems like the chic architecture draft is starting to include functionality, which enables that. Yeah. So yeah, probably in this document, we will in future versions just need to refer to what is actually the content in the chic draft. Okay, perfect. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay, then uh, the next slide, please. Yeah. So we've added this section on single hop communication 3.3. Uh, it's actually quite short, but it was missing. So here, what we state is that uh, for two endpoints that may want to communicate, if they are single hop neighbors, then uh, both of them must store the rules for to allow the communication by using chic for header compression. And in this case, the frame format to be used would be the same one that we had been defining for uh, the straightforward route over. So 
the format is shown on the slide. Uh, you can see the format would correspond to the 15.4 frame payload. It will start at the less mode field uh, with the chic dispatch, which signals that what comes next is the chic compress packet. And if necessary, there would be some padding in the end. Any comment? Yeah, Adnan. Hi. Uh, in the previous slide, the stack that you were showing, uh, you are using the uh, 15.4, but six low, there is, you know, you can use any link there. So, right? Yes. I mean, this is, uh, I think, 8505 RFC is written there. You can use any link there. So you are specific with this uh, link there device, with this stack? Yeah, you mean if, if we are specific about using 15.4, right? Yeah. Yeah. So actually, this has been a question in the, in the working group. And in the last meeting, uh, I had a slide precisely for that question. And um, the feedback from the working group was that it might be better to, to focus on one technology, which is in this case 15.4. And if there is interest on extending the same to other technologies, similar to what has happened with 6Low PAN originally focused on 15.4 and then being extended actually in 6Low to other uh, technologies, then maybe we can also proceed like that. So yeah, that was mostly the, the feedback from the working group, but yeah, it's uh, quite a fair question that has been around. Yes. Okay. Yeah, next please. So in 3.4, it's the section that focuses on multi-hop communication. First of all, we have tried to define some acronyms for the three route over approaches that we have. Um, recall, well, they are the ones shown on the slide. First one is straightforward route over. So the acronym would be SRO. The second one would be the tunnel ripple based route over, currently TRO. And finally, pointer based route over would be PRO. So yeah, anyway, we are open to suggestions if anyone has better ideas for acronyms for, for these different approaches, please let us know, okay? Yeah, next please. Then we have some additional content for each section for these three route over modes. Um, in the first one, we have actually modified a bit the text that describes how the rules have to be handled, meaning what entities need to store the rules. So now we have clarified that all routers in the straightforward route over, uh, all routers must store all the rules. However, a host must store only the rules for its communication with other endpoints. And then after a comment from both Kiran and Georgios, we have added some uh, figures with uh, network topology showing different entities and uh, what would be the rules that would be stored, how things would work. So hopefully this should help understanding how each mode operates. So in this example, as you can see, there is three hosts, A, B, and C, which would belong to this chic over 15.4 network. And then there's a couple of 6LRs. There is one 6LBR, which connects the whole chic over 15.4 network to the internet. And then also there would be some external host E. On the right part of the slide, you can see a legend, which shows in this example that, uh, well, there are three pairs of endpoints that will communicate A and B, A and C, and A and E. And then the corresponding rules that would be used to compress the headers in, in those cases, respectively. So as you can see, in this case, each host would need to store the rules for the communications it is involved in. So host A needs to store all the rules in this case, host B only rule ID one, and host C only rule ID two. And uh, the routers, the 6LRs and the 6LBR need to store all the rules as well, okay? Next, please. Then for TRO, Recall this is the tunnel base, tunnel ripple base route over. We haven't modified the description of uh, who needs to store what rules, but we have added uh, another figure similar to the previous one based on the same example, um, aiming to help um, to compare between the different modes. So as you may remember in this approach, there is 
an upward tunnel for transmitting from a node up to the root, and then there's a downward tunnel for transmitting from the root down to the intended destination endpoint. So <clears throat> in this case, for an intermediate node like a 6LR, it is not necessary to store any rules. So uh, in this case, as you can see, uh, for the 6LRs, they don't need to store rules, but the other entities, the hosts and the 6LBR, they store the same rules as in the previous case. Next, please. Also, there was a comment by Georgios that perhaps for this particular mode, the tunnel ripple-based route over, it would be good to add some figure like one that is used as reference in RFC 9008. Uh, this is a document which describes uh, how we, uh, the different headers are used uh, in the data plane to enable the communication in Ripple uh, from one entity to another, considering all possible combinations. So here we've tried to, to follow something like that with the aim to help clarify how this mode operates. So summarizing a bit, uh, what we have is that for upward communication, the tunnel that needs to be used will start at the first 6LR, say uh, node V, if the 6LN is routing unaware, or it will start at the 6LN itself if it is routing aware, like nodes U and S. Or uh, for the downward routing, the tunnel will end at the last 6LR, if, for example, node X, if the intended destination is a routing unaware 6LN, like Q, or uh, the tunnel will terminate at the 6LN, like say node R, if it is routing aware. Next, please. Uh, previous one, 13, slide 13. Yeah, thank you. So, um, for PRO, we've also added the example with the figure. So remember that in this case, what is done is that each sheet compress packet is preceded by a pointer, which will allow an intermediate node, like say a 6LR, to find in the sheet compress header, uh, which is the IPv6 destination address uh, compression residue, so that a node like a 6LR that has uh, no context, doesn't store any rule, still is able to uh, determine, reconstruct, which is the intended IPv6 destination address. So then it's possible to perform the routing operation. So in this case, as in TRO, the 6LRs do not store any rules. And the difference is that the 6LBR only needs to store one rule, rule ID3 in this case, uh, which is that rule that is used for communication with external nodes. So uh, a 6LBR needs to store the rules only that are used for communication that involve external nodes. There's a comment by Laurent. Yes, uh, something I don't understand in, in this scheme because if you have a rule one and two, Normally, you, they must end at another position, location in the network. And so, with, uh, because rule one is between A and B, that's what you, you mean? Yeah, so A, a and B extension. Okay, okay, yeah, okay, I understand. Ah, okay, <laughs> thank you. Yes. Yes. So, so rules one and two are used to compress packets uh, which are not external. So they are internal. So yeah, in that case, yeah. Um, okay. So the the six LBR only needs to store those rules involving communication with external nodes. Okay. So any other comments? Yeah. Well, um, Yes, a generic command on, on the three mode. I think if we, the first one is something very dangerous and chic is not really adapted for, for this kind of uh, network. So maybe it will be good in the document to say which condition can have to apply to make it uh, work in that mode. For example, that you have no management because, because if you do management, you mean you change things at both ends, but you don't, 
change them in the middle or a thing like this. So just to on this way, maybe there is some uh, place where it will be useful to have this mod, but it's not a generic one. Yeah, uh, I definitely agree. Actually, we, we started to add content in Appendix B, which aims to clarify a bit, like to give a little bit of applicability statement or at least to, to highlight which are the features of each one of these three modes. Actually, one question in the previous meeting was whether, OK, we have three different route over approaches. Do we, is it good to keep like all three or what? So then uh, somehow the feedback was that uh, as long as there's some clear applicability statement, then perhaps it's fine. So quickly summarizing, my understanding is that the straightforward approach is suitable perhaps for very small networks, simple networks, where, as you said, uh, changing context in, in the nodes doesn't create like a lot of trouble. Um, the, the good side about that is that about straightforward is that it provides or it incurs the lowest overhead, header overhead. Then the tunnel based route over is perhaps most suitable when there's communication with external nodes. And if you are handling different possible prefixes as destination endpoints. And uh, the last one, the pointer based one, is perhaps the lightest one, less overhead, when there's communication between nodes which are internal. And perhaps in special cases of external communication where maybe there's just one possible destination, but that would be like an exception. So yeah, anyway, I, I definitely agree. And yeah, we need to add also content about, for example, management of the networks. Yeah. Yeah, Luigi? It's more or less the same comment. I mean, it's good if we have operational guidelines when to use each of these solution, a small analysis, pro and cons and different, maybe something in the security consideration, if any, or just a, the three are equivalent, I don't know. Yes, yeah. yeah, that's a good point because currently, yeah, in so we have this appendix, uh, which tries to provide this comparison among the different approaches, but we don't focus on security there. So that's another point to, to consider. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so perhaps if there is no other comment, uh, next please. Yeah, so uh, Georgios uh, made a comment that the previous summary table uh, was not so accurate. Uh, the terminology was not really well aligned throughout the document. So now we have updated it and hopefully it's now more consistent. Also, we have relocated it because it shows the different artifacts that are needed for the data plane to support the different communication modes supported uh, in, in this document. So quickly summarizing, recall that we have single hop and multi-hop communication. Then we can have route over and mesh under. And for route over, we have the three approaches mentioned, straightforward, the tunnel, and the pointer based. So the fourth row of the table shows the different artifact, artifacts that are needed. Uh, for single hop, it's the chic dispatch only. For multi hop in straightforward route over, it's also the chic dispatch only. TRO needs IP and IP for the tunnels, and there's six low RH, including the source routing for the downward. And also, there's the chic dispatch. For the pointer based, there's the chic pointer dispatch and then the chic pointer. And for mesh under, we have the original mesh headers uh, defined in RFC 4944, plus the chic dispatch. So next, please. Yeah, then um, the main update in 04 is after a comment, actually uh, by Laurent in, in the last, uh, well, one of the last chic interim meetings, that yes, uh, we were using the term chic header in this document. However, now the chic architecture draft is, has defined a term as chic header, which has a different uh, meaning. We were using chic header as something like a chic compressed header. So what we have done is to avoid confusion, just updated all previous instances of chic header in our document. So uh, now we've updated all the figures. Uh, instead of chic header, it's compressed header or in the text is she compressed header. So we are not using this term anymore at the moment. Next, please. 
So regarding next steps, well, first of all, we need to ensure that this document is aligned with the Chic Working Group Architecture Draft. So we will be actively monitoring that. Then um, we also plan to provide some details on uh, rule ID management, meaning when a rule ID needs to be unique within the whole network. And then also we need to at least complete the examples in Appendix A. So is there maybe any other comment? By the way, all of these in addition to the feedback received today. Okay, so, okay, I guess there are no more questions. So then I guess we can proceed to the next presentation. Thank you. So this will be a short update on the PASA documents on the main spec uh, since uh, the last meeting that we had more or less three months ago. Uh, all in all, there is not that much to say. <laughs> this new uh, revision has basically small fixes. So there are a few references that needed to be updated, mainly uh, just that now are uh, RFCs. Okay. Uh, the ID needs to complain for a long time about uh, the some some ASCII art that we have in the in the document. I was lazy to fix it, but now I did it so that uh, <laughs> uh, there are no more complaints from the ID needs tool. So you, there are small changes in the in in the figures uh, now and then. And uh, there, are, there were two main comments on the last document. One was about multicast, and the other was about uh, the suge uh, suggestion to, to use NAT66 in the privacy section. Because if you remember, um, the way we do addressing basically exposes the topology externally if you just plug it directly. So better to be more. Um, uh, let's say take no position, be aware of this risk, that's it. Then you, you solve it the way you want it. Okay, uh, multicast, but there is not that much to say that this document doesn't have any specific uh, feature to the multicast or new multicast messages or, or anything, but it's good to, to state it clearly. Okay. And uh, that's it. Just a small reminder, in principle, this document is supposed to update 8505, just because we are extending the ERO uh, option, and we use one flag that is there. But other than that, it seems really, really stable. That's it in a certain way for this document. Unless there are comments, I will try to share the other slides. Okay, so any comment or question on this draft? So <clears throat> perhaps one comment is that uh, there was actually a, a request. Uh, there was a lot of discussion uh, at the time of adoption uh, of the draft. So maybe it would be a good moment now that the document is getting stable to get some reviews from the working group. Can, can we ask this? after the, the GAO presentation? Yes. <laughs> Even if it is a, an excellent point. Uh, there is one thing that I, I realized today that I missed in this document is the duplicate uh, address detection, in the sense that there are no duplicates because we, we built uh, algorithmically the, the addresses, but we need to state it directly, clearly in the document. So this is a couple of sentences that are missing, but we come back to the review after the GAO presentation.
you submit a resolution. Mm. <clears throat> I'm not sure if uh, 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 you want me to share it. Oh, no. Yeah. Let me ask. Okay, um, we did a small update also on this document. As a, uh, just to recall, um, let me share. Uh, it's too much. It's missing. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, there is a missing slide there. Anyway, the idea was. Um, we have here several mechanisms to register uh, uh, addresses or prefixes, okay? And the BASA document also is a way to uh, ask for, a, for an address and receive an address, okay? Now, while, uh, if you remember, I said, while we were trying to reduce the number of flags that we use in the ERO, option and avoid the conflict with other documents, we came up to the fact that maybe we can have a cleaner uh, design where we have an explicit request for a, an address or a prefix. We receive an, uh, an explicit reply or uh, offer, let's say, and then we register with whatever mechanism is suitable that, that is already existing. So this was the main idea of, of this document. So. I know what comes up uh, is listening for uh, uh, route, routing advertisement or send a multicast router uh, solicitation. Um, he selects the parent node of his choice and he sends a neighbor solicitation with this option in order to say, give me an address, okay? Um, the parent can send back an offer and then we confirm basically the, the choice by the existing mechanism. This is, in principle, exactly what happens in DHCP. So basically, we discover, we receive an offer, we, we, we issue the real request, and we have a confirmation. OK? It's a four-step process. Very easy. Now, the changes that we did uh, looks like a, a new structure, but it's untrue. There was a, a mistake in the markdown uh, file, so uh, was, well, there was one section that was not numbered. So it uh, seems that is, there is a new section, but it's not true. Uh, in the format of the option, we added the, the rover um, field, like in, uh, in the ERO, et cetera. We'll come back to this in this slide, I think. Yes. Um, we requested feedback on the mailing list. No, uh, because um, if we go forward, we need to, to make sure that the, that the format is correct. So there are a few fields in the format that we propose that I don't think, we don't believe there is that, that much to discuss, OK? The, like, type length, uh, status, et cetera, et cetera. This looks like the very basic uh, fields that we need to make this mechanism work. There was uh, something um, to discuss about the IE flag and the opaque, and something that also Pascal raised last time. Uh, how do we use it? Do we need it? We put it. Um, the main idea was that uh, we can sh use exactly the same I flag and opaque uh, that we would use later on uh, for the registration. Okay. And rover. Again, in a certain way, it's the same idea. We can use the same value for uh, all the transactions, basically, which looks uh, helpful. Adnan. To one, you want to comment right away? Uh, with the first slide that you were exchanging the go and the ER, ERO message, mm -hmm. let me go back. I didn't follow your draft, neither I read it. So just uh, curious about what you are doing with the first message with Goa or Gao. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
Buzz on. You want to go back to Mitiko doesn't like your question. <laughs> it, 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 the time is short, no problem. We can discuss later. No, I, I think we are fine with time. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. We the, have time. Uh, the first one. Yeah. Here, yes. Yeah. No. Oh, almost. Here. Ah, here. That so, you're sending the neighbor solicitation, right? Yes. It's a with, the, with this new option. Okay. What this message will do in this Excel app? In the, uh, the the parent that you chose. Yes, what it will do. This is just a request. I would like to receive a, 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 an address or a prefix or something. Okay. And the details are in the option. Okay. So, and the parent will uh, allocate something according to the um, request. So let's make the PASA example, which is okay. the main use case that we have. So basically, I'm asking for a uh, for an address, the, the PASA parent will use the algorithm, mm -hmm. the tree construction, mm -hmm. and offer a, an address. So in, you, then you are saying uh, it's the same NSARO, like uh, in the fourth, in the fifth point. It, My concern is uh, why not you do both things in one multicast neighbor solicitation? Is, is it possible? Ah. Uh, if you do this in one shot and you are restricting, uh, restricting the power. Because, uh, sorry, because uh, concern is we are reducing in the IoT, like uh, reducing the, you know, multicasting and we are going for the unicasting, right? So this is the main goal. So just an idea. If we do both process in just one message, neighbor solicitation, is possible? Just an idea. The, the only way to do is to overload the ERO. I mean, it's uh, not the problem, but consider it if you have mesh under, it's a problem. Whether you are doing unicast or multicast, it's the same as. Uh, you do the multicast only when you come up. Uh, in... No, no. The first one you are saying multicast. The second yeah. one, NS, is the unicast. Yes. Because you are following the same yes. RFC 8505. Yes. So just a question that if you can do both things in one message, one neighbor solicitation, is possible? Uh, just reducing the extra transmissions. Yeah, yeah, I see your point. I just trying to think. <laughs> uh, uh, it's a risk in a certain way. So, so yeah. you, you, it's one shot. Uh, I want something. This is it, and there is no back confirmation in the sense that the router doesn't know if necessarily the 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 the, the child uh, has received the packet and accepted the register the, the the address. That's the can be discovered in 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 other ways. Maybe I don't know. I need to think about. But yeah, in a certain way, this was just following what is a little bit the the DHCP. Uh, the one so, answer that you said that you are increasing the packet length, right? In, in before, if we do it in a one shot, mm -hmm. so it will increase. So, what about the when the uh, neighbor has been sent by the six LBR? It's a big packet mm -hmm. because it's sending a lot of things, mm -hmm. PO and you know CO, a lot of mm -hmm. things. So, mm -hmm. I, my concern is just reduce the transmissions if it's mm -hmm. possible. Mm -hmm. Just an idea, not a question. We can see uh, that there are cons consequences. I mean, yeah. if we reduce, but yeah, why not? This can be, we can even have, I, I mean, both the, depending what, what you like. It's a trade-off. Yeah. yeah, 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 as usual, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good, but good point. So we were here, here, I, but there is Pascal. Pascal, you want to comment right away? Yeah, yes, uh, and uh, hello guys. Um, yeah, I'm confused by the argument about two multicasts because there should only be one in, in this flow once the, the device has found the router which 
comes back with the offer, I mean, the, the, the registration should go unicast to that router. I mean, there is yeah. no point in having the second packet a multicast, which means that yeah. the, the problem is not really there. I mean, it's not two multicasts in a row. I don't think it should. It should be one multicast and then all unicast. Yes. Yeah, unless I missed something. Yes. <laughs> it was my mistake. Maybe I said multicast. If I may say as well, even the first uh, multicast errors in practice is, is not intended to be a broadcast. I mean, it's basically a, a message which is, which is sent to the all router multicast address. And the expectation is that there should be, depending on your network, there should be something like Either the, the first top node is already a router, in which case it will intercept this packet and not multicast it, right? If you, for instance, it's a Wi-Fi access point, if you yeah, send yeah. the RS to the Wi-Fi access point, the Wi-Fi access point being a router will just reply and, and not forward this packet. So there, there is never a real broadcast operation anywhere. Um, now, if you have this structure that we have in this particular network, it could be that the nodes know that to reach, this is, this is aimed at all routers. Maybe they know that the router is at the very top of the tree or something. So they, they don't really multicast or broadcast the packet at all. They just forward it all the way to the root of this tree. And so, so again, it's, again, it's not a real multicast. Yeah, I, I think that I, I was misleading. My, my description was misleading. This document doesn't care about um, the initial multicast and how you choose your parent. Um, this is out of the scope. This is something already existing. Uh, it's just that if I, uh, I, 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 I know my neighbors with, with mechanisms that are beyond this document, and I want to ask for a, an address, that is what I do, starting with the Unicast uh, uh, neighbor solicitation. That's it. So we... we uh, um, my description was a little bit misleading, I, I guess. Yeah, but it might be that your parent is the one actually giving you the address, right? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't need to go anywhere farther yeah. than that. And so, and, and actually, it's very good that your parent does that because if you try to autoconf and there is like a race condition between two nodes trying to autoconf the same value exactly, then you could have a prime, but if you just go to your parent and say, hey, give me the next index that's available to you, and, and you just get it, um, it's all set. And there is never a real broadcast, never. Yeah. Yeah. OK. I, so I, I, I still solicit a feedback for anybody. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you, Adnan. Um, I think that at this point, the decision is uh, whether this, this GAO option is a way forward or not. Uh, and this is, should be uh, decided together. If no, OK, this is the last time that I do a presentation about GAO. We, we, we wrap up with PASA, which we are pretty stable and close to, to, to last call, I would say, if we don't, we don't go further with GAO. If, we decide as a group to, to go forward with GAO, well, we have some work to do <laughs> because we need to, uh, the document or the GAO document is not is such a shape that could be any close to an adoption. I mean, it was the bare minimum to, to try to explain the idea that that's what we did. So it's, it's far from being a high quality document right now. But if you go forward, we have revise the document and revise every PASA because in that case, we there is a lot of machinery that doesn't belong anymore to PASA. PASA can just be a use case and leverage GAO. So yeah, I, I think that that's all I have for today. So any feedback, welcome. Pascal? Yes, I'm very, very uh, happy and positive with the work on GAO. So I really encourage you to, to move forward with this work. Um, now it's up to you and the working group to decide if it merges with PASA as a single document or if it's two documents. But 
Yeah, PASA could be a lot simpler if Gao was there. And I guess you would avoid a number of issues like this race condition. Um, so, so I really love the idea of Gao. Personally, uh, I would prefer to just merge it into PASA, but it's your call. I mean, like you say, if you if you have Gao, then PASA, you, you remove some stuff from PASA, meaning that PASA maybe doesn't stand alone very well unless Gao, you know, comes with it. Oh. So so I'm not sure. But if 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 what if we have Gao, if we publish Gao, that can can you make it that PASA can live by itself and Gao is an option? Or is it that PASA always needs Gao? Uh, if we publish Gao, PASA, in my opinion, has to leverage on on, on Gao. Yeah. Right. Meaning that, that it's, that's... it would be two documents for one. And do we really want two RFCs for one? I mean, that's, that's another question. Mm -hmm. But I love Gao. I mean, for now, please work on it. I mean, please. I mean, I, I open on that. For me, logically, I would say it's two documents. The second one will be pretty small, I would say. But if the, 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 the group prefers to have one GAO document where inside there is the, the, the PASA use case with the, all the details, that's fine as well. I mean... Um, oh, if you I, think it, that the way you will write GAO can be used for addresses which are not necessarily made like PASA, it's more like a, I don't know, a sub-delegation of prefixes or something. Yeah. If you can make it more generic, then it stands on its, and it's useful to have a separate document, I guess. That's that's the idea, and one of the field that we have in the in the in the option is, is um, uh, a value to say how you generate this address. And you say one value, I want a pass address. We can have a, a default value, but give me whatever you have, mm -hmm. or, or something like that. This is something again to decide together. But the, the format we proposed is pretty general, so that that is why I also see the the document as two documents, but again. It makes, it makes sense to me, uh, don't, don't worry. I mean, it's just that probably PASA will have a normative reference on GAO, and yeah. that means that they will, I mean, PASA will be uh, waiting for GAO to share, right? That I don't think we are in a hurry for that. <laughs> so, so, okay, so thank you so much. I mean, that, that's great work. Thank you, Pascal. Hi, uh, Esko Dijk here. Um, yeah, I haven't read this new document about Gao, but uh, what I've just seen from it, uh, it seems useful to have it indeed separate because uh, for PASA, I always thought the, the algorithm that is used for, for selecting the addresses is quite strict for that specific use case or network topology. And now you think about this, it could be used for or many, maybe other network topologies. So that in a way exactly. sounds useful if you can make the option also well, yeah, or, the, or the procedure plus the option efficient enough uh, for the general case then it seems worth to keep, keep it separate uh, okay. in a way yeah? like you, know, you would have two documents tip i would expect yeah okay. okay that's just my current thought thank you yeah carlos gomez from the floor yeah i have a similar opinion so i, I envision gao as a sort of framework that can support PASA or perhaps other similar uh, approaches. And yeah, perhaps that would translate into two separate documents. We might need to see maybe the details of whether that's the actual best way to proceed. But uh, yeah, it would seem like GAO, I think it's also European, right? It's like general. And then one possible use case for that is PASA, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if Let's say that uh, I, I see agreement is supposed to go forward for now for GAO. So in that case, coming back to the review of PASA, we be you better hold on a little bit in order to we revise the, <laughs> the documents. So of course, if you like to read, you have nothing to do in the flight back home, please go ahead and drop <laughs> me an email. Otherwise, just wait a little bit. Agreed. Okay, thank you, Luigi. Thanks all for the feedback. Um, yeah, so next we can proceed. 
to the last presentation on uh, transmission of uh, IPv6 packets over short range optical wireless communications. Yeah, this is Yeonghwan Choi from Metric Korea. Can you move the slide for me? Yes. Yeah, this is the one of the IPv6 over full technology. This is the IP over, over OWC actually. This is the, the second uh, the presentation, and I have two more authors. The one is the Charmin and the Escarus. Next slide, please. Yeah, the first one actually the the first presentation I just the introduc introduction I give introduction to a new idea about that the IBP six over over WC, and this time the number one version is V revised revision, we, we give revision of the IPv6 over, over WC technical issues. Next slide, please. So I put that the two first slides about that the quick introduction that I just gave you the people, the same one. Actually, you can see that all around here, just you can see that the LED actually, the OWC is used that the source of the LED but the LED can we can use that the data communication for that. So that's why I I'm going to make the this document and the standardization in the six row IPv6 over full technology. The next slide, please. And the OWC is actually defined by I triple E eight O two dot fifteen dot seven. So you can see that the detail there. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is the OWC actually, the background inf inf uh, inf information about the OWC. Um, the first one is network topology. Actually, OWC support the P2P and the star topology. The, so we can use that one, the IPv6 OWC support can also more complicated topology like the mesh topology. And the addressing of the OWC actually use two, the 16, bit the sort address as well as the unique the 64 bit address. And the MTU and the bit rate of the authors like that, this, there's a three, five, one, two, one, two, three, but one actually the less than, uh, uh, smaller than the uh, 12, the, the 80 the byte the IPv6 and, uh, MTU, and the other is bigger. So we, we need to, we, that's why we need to, I believe, super few technology here also. And uh, the, the figure the, uh, below uh, up the bottom is the, actually the, the auto-wheel ceiling and the, the physical layer and that the, the right bottom, the fig, no, figure actually show that, show that the uh, protocol thread of IPv6 over auto -C. The next slide, please. So, I'm going to give you that the details about the uh, IPv6 over OWC. First one is the addressing. So, SLAAC actually for two, we use that one, the IFC 84, uh, 48, uh, 6262. And the ID of the 60 bit ID for OWC interface, maybe we refer to the RFC 7136, just we use that. Uh, uh, 16 bit and uh, 64 bit address of the in the like the figure number three. And they also, we are going to they use that RID referred to the RFC 7217. Uh, actually, that the algorithm needs the input parameter like that the in that in interface should the uh, 16 bit link layer address must be the source. And uh, we are going to use that secure hashing. I will jump to 256 bits and the other option and the last one, the secret uh, key should be the last, at least the 128 bit and the must be uh, in the rest of the should, uh, should do, should do random number referred to the RFC port 4086. And the figure three, uh, three is just the link lower address to the like that. The next slide, please. The next second issue is that neighbor discovery, and IPv6 over few uh, over uh, uh, OWC supports mesh, mesh and topology with a lot over. So 
the neighbor discover option, not uh, optimization, maybe refer to that. We use that one, the RFC 6770 and RFC 8505. And then the authority um, LN is the, when the device the connected the six LVR of the authority LN must register uh, its address with the six LVR by NS and the EARO refer to the RFC 8505. And actually, the another topology, the uh, add up something like that, the multiple topology connect to the LBR, maybe LBR perform the DAD, they refer to the six, uh, 6775 for the, the acquire the link local uh, address of the six uh, LNs. And that they, they are to receive, receiving to the RSRA, just the authority LN must follow the section uh, 5.3 and 5.4 the RFC 6775, and the, if the RWC, LR, and LVR must follow the sec section 6 and 7, the RFC 6775. Next slide, please. And the next one is head compression and the uh, fragmentation and the reassembly. The first one has compression, or the header uh, must be compressed according to the encoding the format that is describing the RFC uh, 6282 and the RFAR. Actually, there's two, two kind of that one. The first one is the by one of authors. Actually, the, this one, the NTU is uh, smaller than the uh, IPv6 NTU. So uh, IPv6 of authors must use that file as defined in RFC 4944. And, but the other two, five, two and three, actually does not need to the FIR actually because the, the bigger than the uh, MTU of the IGP6. The next slide, please. The last one actually this multicast and you can map, uh, address mapping and the, yeah, Pascal, do you have a comment or question something first? Maybe yes, the, I mean, the, the reasons, uh, sorry, sorry for the interrupt, but it's, it's related to the, um, the the uh, MTU of twelve eighty. It, it's not just a, a problem related to fragments. It's also the idea that the IoT devices are not doing path MTU discovery. So if if you're talking inside your network and you know your MTU is not twelve eighty, yes, you could do longer than twelve eighty. But if you're going over the internet then if you don't limit yourself to 1280, you have to do path MTU discovery. And so it, it, it's, it's your choice, right? But, but be aware, it's not just about the MTU inside the link itself. Yeah, thank you, so Pascal. So think about whether you want to support path MTU discovery or not. OK, thank you. Thank you for the comment. Thank you. And the next slide, please. And then number five, I actually, I said that the the UK's Marquez address mapping, this, the address resolution pro uh, procedure of mapping IPv6 non multicast address section uh, 4.6.1 and 7.2 of the RFG uh, 48 one and the 6 LBR must keep track of the multicast listeners at authors link level granularity. And the 6 LN always has to send the multicast Packets through the six LBR. This the figure number five is the mapping the format. And the next one, next slide, please. So the connected scenario, just so like we have two. One is actually there's type of there, the, the figure number six. This actually maybe I will revise that one. So maybe six L and the direct uh, connect the six LBR like that with the authority link. And maybe like this, some LED be sourced here, and then we can use that the mobile phone is the connect that they want, like this scenario. And the other one is maybe there are a lot of the mobile phone they can with they can communicate with each other with the, the LED like that, so we, they can make that the isolate the OWC device network. Thank you. The second one. Maybe the woman, you have a comment or something? Yeah, 
Yes, they have thrown tons of chairs in my way. Um, I must admit, I'm a bit confused. Last time I looked at 15.7, this was essentially unidirectional. So when you build a subnet, you have to build it out of unidirectional links and, and maybe throw in another technology to actually do the other direction. And are, are you addressing that or are you assuming it's always bidirectional? Um, not bidirectional, I think. No. If it's not bidirectional, it will be a problem. Yes, it will be a big problem. Okay. I mean, you. Yeah. Sorry, I Adnan, mean that can, the, yeah. yeah, no, if, if you can make the comments on the mic. Oh. I, Adnan here. Uh, the same um, that the Christian uh, said that if it's not bi-directional, then it will be a problem. How can they communicate? You mean that the, the, the first the scenario? If I'm talking to you yeah. and I'm not listening to you, uh, but isn't that the, the there's a right. sensor in in the in, in the in the mobile phone? We have the the LED, the the sensor, and that they can they have a TX and RX. Maybe we can say it, uh, I can show that the, the last two slides. Also they have a listen or they have the they can they the 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 trend, they have two. Also, that they have a uh, sending is uh, checks and Alex and the the technology there, so they can communicate bidirectional, no problem. Yeah. If it's bidirectional, yeah, then yeah, you yeah, can no, yeah you can work it, no problem. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, as I am on the mic, just for the just a suggestion, IPv6 our short range optical wireless communication, right? Just. I want a suggestion if you change it with uh, S R O W C. It's okay because we have also long range optical wireless communications. No, Carlos. <laughs> this is the short range. Is it long range? Oh. Uh, like laser, I think. A few kilometers. They are. They are also considered as a short range. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So perhaps one one point here is that the list politically, let's say. Um, 15.7 is developed by IEEE 802.15, which focuses on wireless personal area networks, which are assumed in theory to be for short range. Although, yeah, perhaps reality is not always like what uh, theory would indicate. Okay, but at least from that point of view, there's some some uh, some reason why we can call that short range. Yeah. I agree that the standard but the point is just for the acronym that he was in because in the in the rfc they are using short range with inverted commas optical wireless communication and the other part of the it's a just editorial thing chain, okay. you know? okay. and the other side you are just using owc instead of sr owc that's the point because okay it was in inverted commas short range optical yeah, okay. wireless communication i got it that one so yeah, this yeah. is the point Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for comment. So, on. Oh, yeah. next slide. The last slide, surely. Uh, so, this is, this individual uh, interest draft actually the number one is for the IPvC over of the C. Uh, we review the details of the IPvC over the, the the technical issue, the detail them and. For the construction for the next step, actually, I 
I'm considering that the SCHC for autopsy will be available. So it's good one, one of the good solutions. So the next version, maybe I will consider that one. And then actually, the, based on the, the current version, actually pretty much the stable and the most stable for the the working group option. So we are planning to ask for the working option, the six working group, the next meeting. Yeah, thank you. So please lead the draft and the product feedback. Welcome, thank you. This a comment by Karsten. So, um, I think it would be good to actually have students play with this stuff. So, if you have recommendations for, for hardware or systems that we could get today uh, and uh, have uh, students uh, work with this, with, with our research operating systems like Riot, uh, and so on, that would be very interesting. Okay. So if you can some point us to to the list just as a starter kit for yeah. for people to play with this and, and to actually maybe implement uh, y your draft, uh, I think we could go ahead much, much faster. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, as Kodak. Um, just on the other comments, so you were talking about uh, just now about unidirectional versus bidirectional. I think if the standard is <coughs> defined uh, with unidirectional in mind, like the uh, IEEE standard, then it's worth to say in the draft that, okay, we, we assume that a device will have uh, a bidirectional link. So to just build on that, so you have to uh, basically effectively two links then uh, between the points. So I think that would be uh, a good start. Okay, Karsten is now going to <laughs> reboot the monitor. <laughs> okay, cool. it needed some input, some human input, right? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, maybe the other uh, question was, well, when you presented about the files, the different speeds, et cetera, um, frame lengths, uh, the first thought I had, well, uh, at least this phi one is extremely suitable for yeah six low on type operation that's exactly what six low is kind of meant to do while phi two and phi three seem to be uh, much less constrained so maybe people there don't want to use six low on, on the one hand so that's maybe something to think about uh, but on the other hand uh, if you think about mesh network topologies they could also use these phi two or three or phi one uh, and if you have a mesh uh, network topology, then I think it again makes a lot of sense to introduce the yeah. slope on technology because otherwise you have to, yeah, use something else and uh, something proprietary or reinvent everything. Uh, so in that case, it's, uh, yeah, still useful to define a six slope on yeah. type yeah. of technologies for those links, even if the compression doesn't maybe uh, help a lot. So that, that are some thoughts. Uh, I don't know what the final ans answer is there, but uh, this is something to consider. So uh, for which links is six low pun actually applicable and why? So maybe that's something that could, could be added there. So you uh, can argue why uh, it's still useful to define six low pun for those files. Uh, although we don't know if it will always be used on, on top of those files. Uh, okay. That's yeah, it. Yeah, thank you. So this is the last slide. Actually, we ha I have two more. The the slides actually I gave you the this one previous the slides, but same. They show is the I had a, a, a test bed like that. I previous to C. This is the TX and the Alex. The also they have that we the, 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 that they communicate the bidirectional like that. The next one next slide show that. <clears throat> It's like, yes, yeah, it's a, a kind of the, the, the test result of the ABFC's overview to the simple link, but the, we can the, the contact each other by direction. And the next one, actually, uh, I, I gave this um, the, the paper like that. You can see that the paper here, the, some detailed information. Thank you. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much. Any other comment? Okay, so thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. For the presentation. And yeah, I guess if there is no other point, I see no one. Well, Karsten is in the queue, but perhaps that's just, Sorry. yeah. Okay, <laughs> no worries. So, okay, so the session ends here and see you all in Brisbane.